Churchill quotes. Apparently, he was, I don't know if this is true, but it doesn't matter because it's a great story. And you'll get used to that with me. So, as I just said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So, um, anyway, so Winston Churchill was, was apparently was due to address a gathering in London and some smart-ass guy came up, instead of introducing the great man to give his speech, he said, Mr. Churchill, um, before you, you deliver your address, would you like to tell us your views on, on sex? <laughs> and so Winston got up, and apparently he sort of came up to the dais as I've just done, and said, Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's interesting, I mean, I, I, all roads lead to Kansas and Missouri for me at the moment. I was, um, I was uh, giving a speech in, in Kansas City recently to the World War I Museum, and the theme of the speech was um, about the legacy of World War I, and uh, does it really have much to do with what's going on in the modern world? And academically, I think it does. And I, and I think there's there's a lot that happened in World War I that, that, that we see the ramifications of, and, and Middle Eastern crisis, and, and the Brits and the French for drawing straight lines around the world and, and creating, for the best of intentions, Israel, Palestine, but an awful lot of disquiet within in the Middle Eastern area. If you look at, at modern warfare technology, thankfully that is still going and I was delighted to be hosted by, by Textron, so well, thank you so much. And from, from the Friends of Spirit today, so I mean that, that whole aviation thing was really spawned out of the First World War. Um, changes in, 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 in the socio-political and socio-economic structure in the United Kingdom, which, which allowed basically the end of the ruling landowning gentry and classes and, and for real people to start dictating the shape of what the country should be. And we'll come on to that again in a minute. And what I'm going to start with is um, the emancipation of women. I mean, basically, my, my, my grandfather used to tell me these stories before he died when I was a little kid about uh, what the UK was like during World War One, And basically, the men went to war, the women stayed home, worked in the armaments factories, kept the economy running. And these were women that had never ever had economic utility before because of what we know about our history. And so women were emancipated because of the First World War. And that's significant for me now because my organization who I work for, which is the UK equivalent of, of State Department, we are celebrating the, the Week of Women. We do this every year and it's something that we believe passionately about. We believe in diversity. We believe in, in the fact that it is our whole community. It's not just a bunch of white middle-aged guys that run our businesses and run our world. So across the United States this week, we're marking the occasion by celebrating the leadership of women. In, in Chicago, we're looking at, at women in business this year. So Mary Barra from um, General Motors, etc., etc., etc. And we're celebrating the leadership and the vision and, and the inspiration of, of successful women on both sides of, of the Atlantic. And the UK and the US continue to have two of the strongest economies in the world, and we have two of the strongest economies in the world because of our women, because of our women entrepreneurs, because of our, of our business, and it was great again to go to Spirit today. And I looked at the board of Spirit, and four women, four men, and I don't need to say any more than that. And much of, much of our strength, I believe, comes from our shared commitment to this. And we understand that our economies cannot just function in the old ways. The figures dictate, look how many female entrepreneurs that we have now in the world. Look how many of our businesses are run by women. So this is not the Brits trying to, because I've, I've been tired this evening listening to the French. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what's going on in Wichita, but I've got to deal with this somehow. The students are all doing their study abroad program in France, and, and you know, so this is not the Brits trying to demonstrate that that we can out French the French. But it is absolutely right for us every year, and maybe once a year is not enough, we should do it more often. 
but I would like all of you to raise your glasses and to to celebrate the success of the women in our communities and in our lives. Yes, all of you in the room, and, and thank you and long may continue to get the men out of the business and the running. So, World War One, the emancipation of women. And, but I talked earlier about communities and how democracy changed in Europe and in the UK and after World War One and after World War Two. So does this have anything to do with what's going on in our world at the moment? And I should say also say thank you, thank you to the American people for um, what you've done over the last four or five weeks from distracting global political attention away from the <laughs> If you can carry it on for another eight or nine months, I will be extremely grateful. I should also thank you for creating a monster in my family for 26 years. I've been a political animal, I've been in politics, I study it, I work it, and my wife has not paid me damned moment's attention for 26 years. <laughs> Until now. <laughs> so you've created the monster in my family with your politics, so um, you have a lot to answer for. <laughs> I would all advise you to drink heavily. <laughs> so, all right, what's going on in Europe? We're not at war, and hopefully we never will be again. And the European Union has helped deliver that peace. But there is disruption. And I think you guys are seeing it in exactly the same way we've seen it, and there are four major elections heading our way in Europe in the next 12 months in this order of Austria, Netherlands, France, and Germany. Three of those nations are extremely important, and I'm not belittling the fourth, which is why I'm not going to name it, but I mean, they're all important, but three are really, really, pretty critical to what's going to happen for my life when we deal with Brexit. So am I saying that what happened in the early 20th century and all the changes that we've had in our world the massive build-up of Middle Eastern refugees in Europe, the decision for the UK to leave the EU, blah, blah, blah. Are we saying that that is all directly a legacy aspect of World War I, World War II? No, I'm not. But issues such as taking back control and this image that I want to go back, I want a historical perspective to my, my own intrinsic polity. Is that not a little bit of going back to where we were? And look at some of the political upheaval and the humanitarian crisis that we've had over the last 10 or 15 years. Shifting trade and economic patterns within Europe and in the Western world. These are powerful. They are not directly responsible to what happened early in the 20th century. But a lot of the causal effects of what happened in those wars are now beginning to filter through into the modern era. So, 23rd of June in the United Kingdom, and I should say, in all candor, I work for an organization that is, that is just driven by media and communications. I mean, I, I wake up in the morning and there is a request from my, what we call number 10, our, our the White House. How much floss did Donald Trump use? Did he start on the left side of the mouth or the right? Was it the molars, the incisors? I need to know every granular detail of what is going on in your world. I came to my office on the, the morning of Friday the 24th of June and there was not a press line in sight. No one in our positions of authority in London and actually across Europe thought this was gonna happen. We just didn't get it. David Cameron, the Prime Minister, literally state his, his legacy, talking of legacies, his political career, his political history, he will now go down as a sort of, uh, in political history in, in the modern age in the UK. And this is a man that really, you know, since 2007, 2008, through his economic policy, turns my guys around. I mean, we, we've got a functioning economy, and I'll come on to this in a minute as well, that is, that is the envy of Europe. And yet this guy is, he was the guy who did this. Why on earth did he do it? I blame it on Chicago Deep Pan Pizza. <laughs> I really do. It was a decision that was taken in Giordano's Pizza Restaurant in O'Hare Airport after the NATO summit in Chicago. So I'm with John Stewart about Deep Pan Pizza. It is an evil thing and it should be banished. <laughs> so David Cameron 
didn't expect it. We didn't expect it. His, his organs of state didn't expect it. And, and ever since, people, people here in the United States have been asking me, what does this mean? What does this mean for the UK? Does this mean that the UK is, is retreating from the world stage? Are we retreating as an outward facing global entity? What does it mean for the integrity of the Western Alliance? What does it mean for European stability? And they, they feel about that deeply held economic insecurity and, and where is the world going and what does this mean for me? Does any of this sound familiar? I don't, I, I am not gonna pretend that I've got definitive answers to this. And what does it mean for the UK going forward? I don't know, we shall see. And I would be skeptical of anyone who tells you that they do know, because the reality is we don't know. We do know some things, but the history is not yet written. Britain will not, as an economy, fall off the edge of a cliff. We will not retreat. We will remain who we are, what we are, what we believe in. And we will continue to work really, really closely with you. And I'll get on to some of that now. So, just clinging to this World War I theme just for a little bit longer. These feelings of insecurity that we all have post-World War I, post-World War II, post some of the other, post-Iraq, post-Afghanistan, you could say post-Syria right now. Are we clear about what we're doing? Are we clear about, about the messages that we've received, both as a polity and as a, and as a leadership? Society, this is the leadership of Wichita. Are you, are you clear about what all this means to you? And the answer is probably no, we're not. And on that level, and we're not really clear on what the impact on the European Union is and what the impact on the UK is going to be with us leaving. Um, but whatever individuals feel about this, we cannot say, I cannot say that the British public were not engaged in the process. They weren't engaged in the choice that was being offered them. More Britons went to the polls on the 23rd of June of this year than in any general election in British history. More voters voted to remain in the European Union than have ever voted a UK government into office. And yet even more than them voted to leave the European Union. This is, this is stratospheric stuff. Among that 52% of people who voted to, to leave Europe, close to 3 million voters, and, and you know that's not a huge amount in your numbers, but for us, that's, that's about 7% of our electorate. They never voted in any election ever before. Such was the scale of this democratic exercise, such was the passion and the interest in what the issues were. And so frankly, all of this stuff that I'm hearing in the news and you may have picked up in, in, you know, on your blogs and the wires and the newspapers and the TV that, you know, it's not going to happen. And honestly, here's my one projection, it will happen. Ignoring the results. Would, would only result in, in further political upheaval, further questioning of the, of the democratic mandate in the United Kingdom. And to quote, I think it was 1965, the East Germans, the East Germans had, an, uh, had a referendum, they had an election in East Germany. This was back in the, you know, in the dark period. And when, when the results came out, the leadership of East Germany basically sat there and said, Maybe it's time we elect a new electorate. Um, well, you know, guys, that ain't gonna happen. It is what it is. So Britain's taken a decision, and it's really, here's my one thing, it's difficult for me to imagine the circumstances in which that doesn't lead to Britain leaving the EU. But, all right, so what? Does that mean that, that Britain is stepping back? It does not mean that we are leaving Europe. Much as many of the electorate would like to tow Britain somewhere into the South Atlantic, probably south of Bermuda, et cetera, et cetera, it's not gonna happen. Tectonic forces don't allow us to do that, whether we like it or not. We're 27, 28 miles from France, and we will remain there. We've been European for X number of thousand years, and whenever anyone questions my Europeanness, I advise them to fly into Heathrow Airport. Get into the middle of London and turn right. And wait till you get to water. Cross that water in whichever way you can. When you get across the other side, you'll probably be in France. Hang a left. And go about 100 miles up. 
and start counting the little white crosses that you will come across everywhere in southern Belgium and northern France, in northern France, which indicates the lives of Brits that gave away, the, gave the ultimate sacrifice for the safety and the security of Europe. For anyone to say that Britain is not European, so I'm going to lapse into the Anglo-Saxon. That sort of pisses me off a little bit. I mean, my, <laughs> my grandfather fought in the First World War. We were talking about my, my father, who wasn't allowed to go to the Second World War because he was a naval architect, blah, blah, blah. I come from a Navy family. I lost 40% of the male population of my family in World War II. Are you telling me I'm not committed to Europe? Give me a break. So we are committed to Europe. It's just people didn't like that entity anymore. They didn't like that model of who they were. So, what does this mean for Britain going forward? Well, The Economist and many other organizations rank Britain as the number one player in soft power. And, and I've talked about our belief in diversity, our belief in, in promoting and, and lauding and, and eulogizing our women in society, eulogizing our diversity in our community, our Muslims, our, our Indians, our West Africans, our Chinese, our Hong Kong, da 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 da, -da. I mean, I've, I've been married to a Korean woman for 26 years, and, and the therapy's working out all right now. I'm still struggling with some of the food, but I'll just stick with Dr. Dharma and his curries. That's, I know where I am with that. So, but actually, it's not soft power. I mean, this is one of the occasions that the Brits need to stand back and say, yeah, we're good at all that governance and that human rights and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, we really are. But we're the US's only ally that projects hard power as well. For if we, if Britain, is not a nation prepared to intervene to secure free trade or the, the things that we all believe in in life, the rule of law, governance, democracy, well, if we're not going to do it, can we really expect anyone else to do it? And what applies to the UK still applies to those members of the European Union, those European partners that we've had. We were present at the beginning of the post-war era and we are not going to abrogate our responsibilities. We will not allow its destruction because like nature, if there is a power vacuum around the world, it will be other forces that will fill it. And I think we all know what we're talking about here. Politics like nature abhors a vacuum. We need to maintain our focus on issues that we all hold dear, irrespective of what your leadership questions you may have. The still bigger picture is there, and it's important that we keep focusing on that. So in or out of the EU, the UK is still a great European nation. I would admit that there are risks to the path that me, my country, I didn't vote for this, but my country, it's taking. It's going to be harder to influence the EU on bigger issues. It's going to be tough for the US that has always relied on the UK to be their voice of reason in the European Union. You're going to need to find somebody else. Who will that be? You will make those choices. It's going to be, <coughs> need to be someone that's got a loud voice that pays enough money to be heard, but you will find somebody. But from our perspective, the EU was a great thing. But it was also a constraint and it was inhibiting. Free trade agreements amongst trying to get 28 nations to agree anything was difficult. Trying to get 28 nations to all agree that our, this is our trade focus, this is our economic focus. So forget feta cheese and parmesan and scotch whiskey and da 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 da. It was damn hard. Why does the EU have so few free trade agreements? Duh. <laughs> That's why. 28 member states trying to get everything from Bulgaria and Romania to agree with Sweden, Finland, and Denmark to agree with Italy, France, and Spain, and of course, my lot, was never going to be easy. And we are the ultimate nation when it comes to free trade. I mean, you think you guys are. Believe me, we are so passionate about free trade. And so it's really interesting. There was analysis done since the election on Brexit on what was the cause of this? And the main reason was, and it was really interesting, I was talking to somebody in this room, and I can't remember who it was, but they hit the nail on the head, that the Brits felt that decisions were being taken about their futures and about their present, their kids themselves, their healthcare, their, their welfare. They were being taken by people they didn't elect. They're not even from the same nation. 
they don't understand what our constraints are, that you can see what the message was. It wasn't really, I mean, that was half. About a third was immigration. Yeah, I'm not going to belittle the immigration story. But be careful where you go with this for Britain. It wasn't about our traditional immigration patterns with the Indian subcontinent, with West Africa. Those relationships that we've had for 300 years, we will continue to honor. It was economic migrancy from Eastern Europe that really, really was the straw that broke that camel's back for the UK electorate. Rightly or wrongly, only one in 20 people talked about trade, the economy. It was about, how dare these guys tell me that my bananas must be straight? And believe me, that was a European yeah. Union directive. <laughs> <laughs> you had to have straight bananas. And this became a sort of axiom for lunacy within the structures. And this just sort of grew, it escalated. It's the sort of the reverse of the peeling onion. You were adding layers onto this onion until the bloody thing's the side of a pumpkin. So it wasn't a mandate for less free trade. It wasn't a mandate for, for, for less engagement. It wasn't a mandate for stepping back. It was a mandate like you had, make America great again. Ours was take back control. Kind of the sort of same thing, really. I do think there will be a cost on free trade. I think the, the nascent transatlantic trade investment partnership with the catchy acronym of TTIP is dead and buried. I really find it very, very hard to see how that is, is, is going to be rejuvenated. I struggle to see where TPP is, is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, how that's going to move forward. Maybe I'm wrong, we'll see. But if you follow the events in Britain, in the press, you'll see there's a lively debate going on at the moment about what do we do? Do we, do we curtail immigration? Do we, do we allow the two fundamental tenets of the European Union? Freedom of movement of goods and trade, freedom of movement of people. I find it really, really hard to see that, that, that the British are going to accept something that doesn't lead to a change in immigration. There will be a change. And therefore, if that one is changing, that one has to change. So what does that mean? I do not believe, and to my banker friends here and around the room, do I believe that's going to change London's position as the preeminent financial services center east of New York? No, I don't. Only about 25% of London's business is dictated by the European Union. Masala bonds from India, it's the largest single trading base of masala bonds out of India, outside of India. The renminbi bonds outside of China, the rest of the world's aggregate trade in renminbi bonds does not touch what we do in London. It isn't just about the EU, and we will find a way. So London will remain. I do think there will be some measures around trade, we need to look at this and we'll, we're going to see what that means. Does it, does it impact on our manufacturing base? It might. But I pose a question to you that at the moment there are no German vehicles manufactured in the United Kingdom. And yet Germany has a 35 to 40 billion dollar trade surplus in, in automobiles for the United Kingdom. Are you going to tariff that and allow that trade, that intra-European trade to diminish? We shall see. Personally, I believe that it is in Europe's interest, it's in the United States' interest, it's in the rest of the world's interest that we find a solution to this. Because it's right that Britain continues to have that role on the international stage. We're a member of the UN Security Council, we're a member of the G8, the G7. And here, I have a, a real degree of sympathy with Donald Trump. Not something I ever thought I would find myself saying in front of a room full of people, but it's true. <laughs> when he talks about NATO and he talks about the shared responsibility that we all have for security, he's right. The US at the moment is picking up in excess of 70% of the cost of water. There are only two of the major powers in NATO that meet their defense requirements, which is 2% of your GDP, and that's the UK and the United States. We have a new program that's working, and, and I'm going to morph now into US-UK. What does this mean for, for the US? Well, we are building two new aircraft carriers, 
And we are building two new aircraft carriers primarily so that you guys can use them in the South Atlantic and in the Mediterranean. <laughs> and not only that, we're going to buy F-35s and, and helicopters to stick them on there, and we're going to buy them from you as well. So you're going to do all right out of this with us. <laughs> so it goes back to that, that hard power thing again. But he's got a point, you know, when, when only five members of NATO, NATO meet their 2% requirements. And with the greatest respect to the other three, Estonia, Greece, and Poland, <laughs> I'll leave that on hand. <laughs> so, throughout my career, and I've been, as it says up there, my God, I've been a diplomat for 30 years. God, no wonder I'm a jaundiced old bugger. 30 years, goodness gracious. Anyway. Throughout my career, um, I've, I've been a part of and I've witnessed and I've championed the relationship between the US and the UK, both when it was fashionable and when it wasn't fashionable, and there have been times. I've spent a career working closely with, with US counterparts. I remember my time, I was so privileged to be ambassador to Cambodia, and my closest pal, actually genuinely my closest pal in Cambodia was the American ambassador who basically saved my life. And if anyone can remember the Bali bombings in Indonesia, which would have been, I don't know, 2002, something like that, if any of students of history here. And they were led by a guy called Hambali. And Hambali ran away from Indonesia and ended up in the Islamic community in Cambodia. And he decided he wanted to carry on his, his uh, devilish ways. And he looked at the US ambassador and the UK ambassador. And I wonder what better security than the American or the Brit. You can imagine. And I remember having a phone call from the then US ambassador who phoned me up one morning and said, I think you better get down here pretty quickly. So blah, 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 blah. I was about three weeks away from a terrorist hit on, on my office, uh, which would undoubtedly have blown the British Embassy. It was the Americans who kept me alive. It wasn't my guys, it was you guys. Um, we, we were instrumental in delivering a genocide trial for the Cambodian people. To, not to, to, to keep replaying history, which the Brits have a tendency to do, says he, talking about World War II in 1940. Anyway, World War I. But it was about allowing the Cambodian people to be able to reconcile their history. That was the Americans and the Brits. And we brought the French and the Germans and the Japanese and the Chinese to the table. It was the Americans and the Brits who did. We instituted new legislation in Southeast Asia on child sex and child sex tourism because places like Cambodia were becoming a hotbed of, of the abuse of small children. And I'm not going to go into the minutiae because it still upsets me. The Americans were there, and we were there. <coughs> Wherever you look, the Americans have played a role. And it's a tough role, because when you do it, you're criticized for doing it. And when you don't, you're criticized for not doing it. This is the role you play as the preeminent entity in the world. And let me remind you all now, because every now and again, there's a lo lovely London expression, which means you need a slapping. <laughs> and this is my slapping to you, which basically means I need to remind you that you are the most preeminent, preeminent, dominant, important, significant nation on earth. You are the most important economy on earth. Get over all this stuff that you're beating yourself up. It's the end of the world. Oh, God, we're doomed. You're not. You'll find a way, just like we are going to find a way through what we've got. And you beat yourself up a lot. And I guess you're allowed to because you have that diametric of, of view in your society. Should we go into Syria? Well, the Brits aren't, so what do we do? It's tough. It's tough being number one. But you're still number one and you will continue to be number one. And right beside you will be us. And it will be a different relationship. We will no longer be your partner in the European Union. You won't be able to rely on us to deliver messages to Brussels, because <laughs> frankly, they don't want to listen to us, and I do complain <laughs> them. But we will still be there, and we will be there with you as we were in Syria, not in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and we'll have those discussions like we had with you in Syria. And, and I, I pose a question to you. That big dis I remember Dick Cheney um, saying, we can't trust the Brits, they won't go into Syria with us. We had a democratic vote. We had a mandate from our parliament on Syria. I wonder what result you'd have got if you'd put it to Congress. I just 
leave that out there because I am not convinced you have got congressional approval to do it, Syria. But we will take that criticism because, like your best friends and like partners or husband and wife, every now and again we don't always see eye to eye. And there will be times where that happens. But think about what we do together and what makes us stronger, our students, our science. Here's a classic, 1970-something or other, my memory fades me. We, we talked to NASA and said, look, we've got a new satellite technology that we would like to try. Do you mind sticking it on one of your rockets? And they said, yeah, we'd love to. What we didn't know is that NASA had already had discussions with the DOD that the next rocket they were going to send up was going to get blown to bits by a controlled nuclear experiment by DOD. So we put our $100 million satellite on this thing, and within about 45 seconds of it getting up into the atmosphere, DOD, that's a special relationship. <laughs> so, financial crisis, blah, 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 blah. Look where we are, and we're still here, and we're not going anywhere. Um, and we won't go anywhere because we're not daft either, because we know what's right for us, and we know who our strategic partners are and what our strategic partnership should look like, and who the actors and actresses should be, and that's a little veiled comment about somebody who you might hear who's playing a role at the moment, who frankly has no place to be playing that role. We will work all this out, and you will work it out. Now, I could carry on wittering on in true diplomatic fashion, because I do get paid by the word. <laughs> um, so what I thought we'd do, rather than me preaching, I think you got the message, right? That we're right on. Um, we're not going anywhere. Um, I thought I'd open it up and let you <coughs> ask things of me. And, and if we work on the basis that I'm not going to feature on the front page of the New York <coughs> Times or the Post tomorrow, I'm happy to deal with whatever issues you want. I've been in politics 30 years, way longer than I care to remember, but I've been in business a long time as well, and, and I, I know the difference, but I know the importance of the relationship between the two. So, why don't I shut up and let you pose me some questions? How does that work? Yeah. What is the difference between Great Britain and the United Kingdom? One includes Northern Ireland and the other one doesn't. So it's the Great Britain, Great Britain, and then the United Kingdom. So it's Great England, Britain. Scotland, and Wales is Great Britain. The United Kingdom includes Northern Ireland. It might well be. <laughs> but one includes Northern Ireland, the other one. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Yeah. Well, now I'm in trouble. Yeah. HSBC is on the war path. No longer Bank of America. Given your view on the UK and its relationship to the European Union and the U.S., do you see a heightened level of volatility in the pound, the euro, and the U.S. dollar going forward? Actually, no, I don't. I think I think the, the pound is going to stay around one. Can you repeat the question, please? What's going to happen to the pound? What's going to happen to the markets in, in the U.K., and what's going to happen to the pound? Um, if you have a look at our markets, our markets have been a little bit like yours. Um, we had a little, a little hit right after Brexit, and then we've had some of the best numbers. You'd expect that. If, if you've got the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, if you've got the Board of Options, you've got the Futures and Derivatives guys operating out of London, they're going to love this volatility. volatility. But um, no, the markets are doing very well. I think the pound is going to stay pretty weak for a while. We're at about, let's say, 125. Just before the Brexit vote, I would say between 145 and 150. I don't see it changing too much, not until it's clear what the terms or at least the framework of the terms of the Brexit agreement will be. Because right now, with all of this media stuff that we're hearing, we're in the land of hypothesis. And, and you know, my newspapers and your newspapers and the European newspapers can say what they want. We haven't even pressed the button on, on the engagement thing, which is called Article 50 to start the process of leaving Europe. And yet here we are saying, well, we're doomed, we're all going to die. Well, we haven't done anything yet. <laughs> we're still in the European Union. We still pay our money, blah, 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 blah. So I would say you're not going to see too much difference from 125, at least until we press the button, which 
I think will be in March next year. Yeah. Our companies use the UK as our base for building our business in Europe. Uh, so the integration there has been very important to us. In the near future, Article 50 is going to be is going to be triggered. What should our people in the UK be doing in communicating with their elected elected representatives in the UK, with the other other government entities, to make sure that the UK continues to be a viable base for addressing our European customers and servicing them with our products. For the next two and a half years, the UK is still a member of the European Union. Nothing is changing. And frankly, the first year is going to be a posturing year. So nothing's going to change. And the reality is, and here's, here's advisory number three, um, we've got big elections in Europe. Nothing is going to happen in Brussels on any substantial level until the future politics of France and Germany are done. Because whatever we may think of the European Union as a sort of cabal of 28 nations, it is, but it's like any other organization. It's you pay the money and you pay the most money and you make the decisions. France and Germany will be highly instrumental in determining the nature of that agreement. I am not an alarmist, I am not, I do not believe that there will be a massive structural change. We will have to take a hit. We cannot change our immigration status to something, and let me put, let me be clear about this. I'm not, I'm not talking about sort of closed borders and, and Steve McQueen fences where you've got to get from you know Northern Ireland to Southern Ireland on a 125 motorbike over a 15 foot high fence. <laughs> I'm talking about an immigration policy that is designed to work for the economy rather than through a separate national entity. In other words, our much vaunted health service, believe me, without South African doctors, Filipino nurses, blood, you get where I'm going. We need a viable, functioning immigration policy that allows our economy to continue to function. That's, that's what we're looking at. We're not looking at zumzum autarky. At the moment, we have a situation where basically communities from Eastern Europe can come and go as they please. And there were some, there were some high profile scenarios. One famous one was a Bulgarian taxi driver driving in London who was not only being paid as a taxi driver, he was claiming unemployment benefit and sending the unemployment benefit back to Sofia for his wife and three children. Not surprisingly, some British taxpayers said, whoa, Tiger, what's this all about? Now, was this prevalent? Probably not. There were isolated incidents. But you only need a few of these. So immigration will be an issue, and the, the trade-off will be in our economic relations in, in some trade. What's the trade position between the UK and the US right now? Anybody know? So we have a free trade agreement, right? We have a tariff-free... No, we don't. No, we don't. We do not have a free trade agreement between the UK and the US, and our tariffs average about 4%. And our regulatory framework can be an absolute pain in the ass. <laughs> our seatbelts are different to your seatbelts. Our headlights, our indicator lamps, they're different. Get into medical instruments, get into pharmaceuticals, and yet we do a trillion bucks. We have a million people being employed by your companies in the UK. And the UK is the biggest foreign investor in the United States. It's not China or Japan or Germany, it's the UK by a factor of about two. And we have about a million people working for British companies. That's not going to change. In fact, if it's going to change, it's going to go in a better direction because we're going to have to work harder to work with you guys. And instead of us being a constituent member of the EU, one of 28, where we're on a parallel, we go from there to there. US, UK. We are going to need to make concessions. So is this going to impact on your business into Europe? It might. But it's also going to grow your own business because you are going to be in a much, much stronger position by dealing with us. And we know that. We recognize this. But we don't have a free trade agreement with you right now. We have, we've never had one. I wish we did. So 
Yeah, but two and a half years. It's a, a, a lot of stuff's going to happen between that. My God, I've silenced you all. <laughs> <laughs> Alcohol, drink heavily, drink more. <laughs> Go on, Dan. All right, I'll come to you in a minute. What do you think about the uh, turkey? And I like it. I normally have it at Christmas instead of Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turkey's an interesting issue. Is Turkey Asia or is it Europe? Yeah. Um, God, we need Turkey. We desperately, desperately need Turkey. Um, and Turkey's had a little lurch in the direction that I don't think any of us are happy with, with, with Erdogan, and I'm not. It's not. I'm not breaching any foreign policy secrets here. But we have to work harder with these guys. And again, Turkey had the, the carrot was dangled in front of them of EU membership. And we've played games, and they've played games. We need a much more strategic and straight line approach to Turkey less duplicity. It's a tough one, though. Sir. So, uh, during your, uh, I know this is during the, in the land of hypothesis, as you say, but. I live in the land of hypothesis. Do you believe that, for a living. well, do you believe that the UK, or it'll be the EU who wins uh, <clears throat> during the um, <clears throat> argument about Article 50, who's going to, you know, concede first? Like, will it be the UK, or? Well, we're going to press the button. Right. So, I mean, the, the thing about this, and I go back to what the slogan was, is taking back control. So the idea is that we will decide, we will not be dictated to by what is deemed by the British electorate to be an unelected supranational entity. So in other words, it's a bit like the UN is saying to you, you're going to hold elections next May. And the Americans are going to say, why are you saying this to us? Now, okay. That's an extreme example, but there is a degree of logic in So Britain will decide when it presses the button, and as I said to you, it will press it almost certainly in March. Why? Because it's a two-year process. Britain will have its next elections in May 2020. Theresa May, and talking about women in government, I just would like to add that my head of government and my head of state are both women. Anyway, I just passed that out. <laughs> um, she will need about a year to hold the party together. So she needs to be in a position where whatever we end up with with Europe will be done and dusted by April at the latest. We need to wait for the French and German elections. Do it in March. You're going to waste the first year anyway because it's all going to be full of postering and politics and guys like me pontificating. <laughs> the, the first year is, is, is going to be pretty bland. Then you kick it in. So you may as well. Do it early, let the French and German elections get out of the way. See what happens there too. And I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom here because I do believe the European Union will hold together, but there will be some more surprises coming our way. I, I feel pretty, pretty clear in my mind about this. Um, so who's gonna win? I don't think any of us will win. I don't think you win in these things. It's just gonna be what we end up with will be a little bit different. There are those in Britain that say it will be better, and there will be things about it that will be better, and one of them will be the need for Britain to work so, so much harder on this relationship. Someone else wanted to get yeah. Going further on that, does the UK have the next 100 days kind of mapped out? <laughs> no. <laughs> and we're making it, but there's something you need to know about British foreign policy. We don't have a constitution. We kind of make it up and go along. And the Europeans have always teased the Brits, and they call it the pragmatic foreign policy. You know what that means? We deal with stuff when it arrives on the table. Oh, we better deal with this now. Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. We don't have plans, but we make it up as we go along. Um, we know what we want out of it. We want, we want to secure London's place as the preeminent financial services market for us. Very important to us. We want our manufacturing, especially in aviation and the auto sector, to continue because we are the second biggest aviation market in the world. The US is, whoosh, we're there. Auto, we're the second biggest in, in Europe behind Germany. I mean, if you add in trucks and stuff, then it's probably Spain, but, but we're a big auto player. We need to protect this. And so, but have we got it mapped up? I'd love to say we do. But. But frankly, we're better than that. We make it as we go along. 
<laughs> My French exchange student. Don't you ever, ever do that to me again. All right, good. No. Does the UK departing open it up for other countries to leave, and will that you uh, lead to the EU falling? Sure. That's that's the $94 million question, it really is, um, because what Europe is afraid of is that if one or more of the other big economies goes, then it really, really does call into question the European project. Do I think there will be others who will posit the idea, yes, I do. And there is a risk. I do not want to be a prophet of doom because I actually strongly believe in Europe. I believe in the European Union model. I think it's, it's, it's helped us to deliver a safer and more collegiate Europe. Europe is a, it's not an easy mix. I mean, you go from Greece to Finland to Spain to Britain and Ireland, it's pretty hard to keep all this together. And I, and I think the EU has kind of done that. Um, but the EU, let me take a step back. What was the genesis of the European Union? The genesis of the European Union was really to stop Germany and France from the war again. So it started out as the European iron, steel, and coal deal in the, in the 1950s. Winston Churchill was a great believer in a collegiate Europe, except he didn't want Britain to be part of it. He wanted Britain to stay with India and Australia and New Zealand and all that. That was, that was the Churchillian model. Britain realized in the 1970s actually there was a real benefit of this because it was called the European Economic Commission. The European Economic, it was called the EE. And, and that E has dropped. And that's when Britain started to get worried, when we started talking about a European army, a European police force, because we don't want a European army. We like NATO, thank you very much. We like working with a military partner that we know that we can deal with. And so the Europe model, the Europe project changed and Britain didn't really change with it. It still liked the fundamental tenets of, of European economic cohesion and European economic union and it still does. It doesn't like the idea of a pan-Europe with British soldiers going to war alongside our American partners with leadership from another nation. It's going to be extremely difficult for the British Army ever to do it. We'll do it with the Americans, we'll do it with the Australians, we'll do it with the Canadians, we'll do it with the Kiwis, and we'll do it with the South Africans. We struggle with anyone else. And so the model changed. And yet there was that expectation of automaticity that, well, we'd all just go with that. We never liked the Euro. We never liked the common immigration policy, which is why we never signed up to vote. There's something called Schengen visas, which we're not part of, we never have them. The Euro, we're not part of, because, and it all went too far for us. It was, whoa, that's not what we signed up for. So, we'll see. All right, that's probably enough, isn't it? Yep.